Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Indusoft User Interface Webinar. Uh, my name is Scott Cortier, and I'm the Senior Technical Sales uh, for Indusoft. And uh, today we're going to be covering the user interface options that you have within Indusoft Web Studio. And uh, before we get begin, just a couple logistic things. And I mentioned this a little bit ago, but we've had uh, quite a few people sign in since then. Um, if for those of you who are new to this uh, type of webinar, I, I can't hear you. Uh, so if you need to communicate something to me, if you uh, have any questions, uh, comments, feel free to put those into the uh, chat window or the Q&A panel within the WebEx interface. And uh, I'll try to take a look at those during the presentation, but more than likely I'll get to, to answer those at the end. Um, it's a fairly busy uh, webinar. What I mean by that is I've got a lot of little topics that I'm going to cover. Uh, I, I hope that I can get in in under a, an hour. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we will be sending out links to the uh, video and to the slides uh, after this. And, and after that, we will also include um, a short survey. And if you give us your name and address and shirt size, we'll send you a free T-shirt just for joining us today. Uh, there's also been some comments that we've gotten uh, feedback on, on some of the previous webinars. People have asked us to go slower. People have asked us to go faster. People have asked us to slow down, speed up, go longer, go shorter. So uh, what I'm going to try to do is, is uh, make this just about an hour as we uh, announce. We might go a little bit longer if we have uh, some questions, but uh, feel free to put those questions in the Q&A chat panel or the uh, or Q&A panel or the chat panel. And, um, uh, we'll see if we can't get to those. So uh, again, I'm going to try to cover some some uh, advanced topics, uh, some beginner topics. So if you uh, have any questions, as always, feel free to contact us, and uh, we can get your uh, questions answered even after the webinar. So this is not the end all of of all user interface stuff. Feel free to contact us if you have questions. Uh, as we get going, uh, I'm going to cover really two types of user interfaces uh, within this uh, webinar. As I got to putting together the material for this, I realized really there's a piece of this, and we didn't really announce this, there's a piece of this that's, that's the user interface for the development environment within Indusoft Web Studio, and there's the user interface that you create as a part of your project that you're going to deploy um, as part of your project. So we're going to cover uh, some things on both of those fronts. And, and again, we're going to do some basic stuff, some a little bit more advanced stuff, and hopefully this gives you some ideas, uh, opens up some, some thinking uh, on your part, and gives you some more ideas of things to do. So uh, what are we going to cover here? Uh, let's uh, uh, talk first of all about the uh, Indusoft Web Studio development uh, environment, the user interface. And, and just to get some, some ideas or some, some uh, terminology down, uh, we're going to take a look at this, this user interface here. And across the top, we've got this ribbon interface that uh, was deployed by Microsoft. Oh, geez. Um, I think the first time I saw it was 2007, on Microsoft Office 2007. And uh, just for some terminology, we've got the uh, tabs across the top here. And those tabs change depending on what you, you have selected. So for example, if you have a screen open, you'll see graphics here. Uh, if you've got an object selected, you'll see a format tab here. And what's really nice about IndieSoft Web Studio is the, the user interface tries to uh, anticipate what you're doing and change depending on what object you have selected or what windows you have open. Uh, uh, and hopefully, if you've been using IndieSoft Web Studio for any length of time, you'll, you'll understand that there's a Project Explorer and these four tabs and database spy and output window for some troubleshooting. What I'm going to show you um, is uh, some ideas of how you can expand and improve on the user interface and, and talk about some tools that you might not know uh, that they exist. Or Let me show you how to use those. Uh, also, I wanted to mention that uh, we do have our full uh, five-day training course uh, is is available in Austin, Texas, uh, or as well we have it online. We have our entire training class online in video, so you can always take a look at that. Uh, I wanted to point out here up at the top this quick access toolbar real quick. Uh, we're going to uh, take a little bit of time here and, and modify that and, and, and add to that. That's kind of an often overlooked uh, little tool. So as we get going here, I'm going to show you uh, how we can add icons to that, and we're going to uh, cover a few different things within the IndieSoft Web Studio uh, user interface uh, kind of ideas and concepts here. So um, what I'm going to do is um, 
somewhere here, I have IndieSoft Web Studio. And what I'm going to do is uh, just create a brand new project so we, we start fresh. Um, and we'll just leave that as local interface. And we'll go full screen here. And um, all right, so uh, what we have up here is this quick access toolbar. And if you pull this uh, drop down down, you can you can modify the tools that are available in here, the icons. And uh, another thing that again that's often overlooked is the ability to add more commands into here, so that you can let's say that you constantly find yourself needing to push objects to the back. Uh, of the list. What you can do is you can pull in here, go to Format, pull this down and say, okay, there's Bring to Front. Uh, I want Send to Back, and I want to add this to the toolbar and say, okay. And so now I have that uh, Send to Back on that Quick Access toolbar. No matter what menu I'm in, it's always going to be available to me. Uh, so that's another nice feature that, uh, that can be done here. In addition to that, uh, what you can also do is, is uh, apply keyboard shortcuts to those uh, as well. So if you are keyboard driven, as I know some of you are, uh, long time Windows users, uh, uh, power users, uh, you're going to want to do things on a keyboard and uh, that will make things a little bit easier to you. So hopefully um, that's, that's new information for you and, and will help you out. Uh, so that's uh, something you can do there. Uh, the next thing that I wanted to cover is uh, also an often overlooked feature uh, called Disable Drag. And uh, I'll tell you that uh, as long as I've been working with IndieSoft uh, Web Studio, this, is, uh, this has been in the product since the early days. Uh, and uh, it, it really fits the way that I personally develop screens. Let me tell you uh, where this feature comes in handy. Let's say that you've, you've drawn a screen and aligned objects and configured things and, and now you want to come back and see how this is configured. But when you double click, maybe you're not so skilled with your mouse or you've got a sensitive touchpad or something, and instead of double clicking, you, you, you click and you accidentally nudge an object. Well, rather than uh, hitting Control Z and, and undoing, uh, one of the things that you can do is it's available uh, in a couple of different places. It's available here on the Graphics tab. There's this thing called Disable Drag. You can also see that uh, the pop-up tool tip there that it's uh, Control D can enable it. You can also right-click and uh, on the background of the screen and disable the drag. Down in the bottom status bar, you'll see No Drag down here. And what that does is uh, you cannot move the objects on the screen. I am holding down my mouse and trying to move those objects. It's locked to those in place. So I can double click and still get at the properties of the objects, uh, but I can't accidentally nudge those out of, the, out of the way. Where that comes in handy is if you, again, typically the way that I develop screens, uh, this works very well for me, which is I develop the screens cosmetically, and uh, sometimes I have to go back and check the configuration or change the configuration. And what I'll do is I'll lock the, the screens uh, by using this disable drag and uh, that way I don't accidentally move things by a pixel or two. That is saved on a screen-by-screen -screen basis. So as you get finished with a screen, you can lock that down. Or maybe you've got some really detailed uh, things that you've drawn. Uh, this gives you a, a nice way to do that uh, as well. Um, setting defaults uh, by using right-click. Uh, this is an often overlooked uh, feature as well. I think I put this into the training videos, but for those of you who haven't watched those, uh, this is a really a nice feature here. So let's let's take a button, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a button on the screen here and just leave this uh, off to the side. Oh, look, I can't move that. Uh, disable drag is turned on. I'm going to go ahead and turn that back off. I'm going to move that over here. Another user interface feature is, uh, for those of you who don't know, you know, copying and pasting is, has been around in Windows forever, and you can control C and control V for that. Uh, or within IndieSoft Web Studio, I can just hold down the control key and click and drag an object. Now, for those of you who have had uh, some slight issues with this, maybe you've uh, hit control but uh, never dragged the object off of there, uh, one of the things that we're changing in the Service Pack 3 that's coming out uh, here in just a few days is uh, that you actually have to move it to, uh, for the copy to be created. So there's going to be a little less um, nuisances of, of creating duplicate objects and not knowing about it. 
Anyway, moving on. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you why I've created this object over here, this button, and, and left it sit there in just a minute. But let's say that I wanted to uh, have a standard button that I drop down on my screens, but I don't want it to look like this type of button. Let's say that instead of using the 3D Sharp, I use the standard. And let's say that I'm, I'm going to be creating maybe some navigation. I know I'm going to be doing a lot of it. So maybe I want this to go to a main screen, a, a different screen, whatever. And so I'm going to put a placeholder in here of just some, some letter X's and then screen. So I can uh, change the X's later on to the word main or to the word uh, I.O. or whatever type of screen I'm going to go to. And then maybe uh, in addition to that, I change the background color to be blue, and I change the font uh, to be uh, white, let's say. And I like that uh, layout of that button, and I'm going to use that uh, throughout my uh, project. What you can do is right-click on this and say Set as Default for New Objects. And now when you grab a, a button from the toolbar, instead of creating this uh, default button that we grabbed first, it will use that default that uh, you had before. Now I can just come in here and change this to main and uh, uh, create a new one here. And uh, we'll go to uh, startup. And so you can see that uh, that becomes really handy. Now, the reason why I put this button down here is there's no reset of this um, currently. And uh, uh, what I've done is I put this default button here so I can just go back to this set as default for new. Uh, and that way when I now drop a button down, it goes back to the original default. So uh, that's a, a fairly handy tool. And that also works for other objects as well. Uh, so for example, rectangles, if you don't like this light blue color, maybe you wanted a a uh, different color with a different outline, different thickness. You can save those as default as, as well. Um, all right, so moving along. Uh, that's, that's setting defaults, right-clicking. Um, oh, just FYI, multiple configurations uh, with Service Pack 3 is coming soon. So for example, if uh, uh, I had a rectangle here, and in the caption field I put uh, this, uh, instead of doing that, let's do this. Let's uh, cancel. And if I copied this uh, rectangle and I held down my shift key and I selected both of those, in uh, Service Pack 3, again, that's just coming out of here in a few days, uh, I will be able to configure those simultaneously for colors and line thicknesses and where they have common properties. So uh, I'll be able to do that. Uh, again, you'll be able to do that with Service Pack 3 that's coming out here uh, shortly. Um, Next thing uh, that I'd like to cover is the tab order. So when you're creating a project, and uh, let's say that you've got some text entry or even some buttons. Um, let's say that I put some text entry, let's say temperature 1. And uh, then I have some pound signs here. And I make this a uh, text data link. And I go to temp 1 and input enabled. That doesn't exist yet, so input enabled. And then let's say I copy this down, change this to temp2, go back to the text. Temp2 doesn't exist. I'll make that. And uh, again, back to the text here. And um, so when you, oops, where did that go? Here we go. Uh, the the uh, idea or the concept that I'm trying to get across here is when you uh, are doing uh, your runtime, and so back to the text, change this to two. When you're doing uh, in your runtime, when you're running your project, there's going to be a certain order that these go to. And typically, it's, it, in the past, it's been based on the layering number. Now what we have is uh, this tab order. So for example, if I run this screen, and what we'll see is the where the focus is. So for example, this, this object has, currently has the ability to enter a number in here. When I hit Tab, I go to the next object, and I hit Tab, and I go to the next object, so on and so forth. I have these tied to the same tag, but you get the idea. Um, so I'm just hitting Tab, and that's a tab order for 1, 2, and then eventually 3. But let's say I wanted to change up this tab order a little bit. What I can do is right-click, and then go into the tab order 
uh, area. And you can see that these little floating numbers here present me with the tab order. So instead of these uh, being in, in this order, let's say I wanted to start with the middle one first, then go to the top, and then go to the bottom one. So it's one, then two, then three. Uh, now I can get out of this tab order. And now when I run this, it starts in the middle. I hit tab, I go then go to the top, and then go to the bottom. So uh, where this is handy is if you move objects around, uh, or let's say that uh, uh, where I've seen this used is, is maybe you have operators uh, entering data uh, around an irregular shaped object. And rather than doing them clockwise, you want them to do, maybe it's a bolt hole pattern for tightening of, of wheels or something that uh, 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 you want them to do in a specific order. You can place these objects around and then, and then have this uh, go again into a specific order. This also works with uh, groups of objects. So for example, if I take these bottom two and I group these, now when I go into the tab order, you can see that there's a, in this case, it's a dot. Uh, so that I can change these uh, within that group and they stay relative to each other. Another thing is you can double click on this and then type in the tab order as well. Um, so that's uh, something that you can do there too. So let's do that and uh, jump out of the tab order. So that, that gives you a few different ways to do uh, tab order. Uh, also, um, if, if we were to have a button here, let's say, uh, we can, uh, if we have the command animation applied and we go into the configure, I believe the uh, enable focus, um, uh, if you uncheck that, that will allow that uh, object to be skipped uh, in the tab order. So if you're tabbing around, if you want that button uh, to be skipped, then you can uncheck that. So that's a, another way that you can do that. Oh, let's see here. Uh, window and uh, tool features. Oh, here's, again, some user interface uh, ideas within IndieSoft Web Studio. So there's auto hide. Uh, for those of you who don't realize that, uh, especially as screens start getting larger and larger and uh, <clears throat> you have uh, the workspace that you're, you're seeing is, is larger, or I'm sorry, the workspace that you're seeing is smaller than your actual screen space. Rather than having to scroll around, there's a few different things that you can do. You can go here into the View menu and click on Fit to Window, and that will fit your, ob uh, your entire screen within the window that you have available. Uh, sometimes that makes the objects a little bit smaller and uh, not very easy to see, but it does give you the, f the flexibility to then uh, position things on the entire screen wherever you want them to be. Uh, uh, personally, I don't like working in this this mode unless there's a, a, a really big screen. Recently, I was uh, working on a project that was uh, uh, several high definition monitors spanning uh, expanded across two uh, kind of a video wall format, and uh, uh, it made it really nice to be able to see everything all in one one space. Uh, another concept within this uh, zoom window. Uh, in the view tab here is let's say that I wanted to specifically work on uh, maybe just these these buttons here. I can click on this zoom area, select the area that I want to zoom into, and it will zoom into just that area. Note that my cursor is still a magnifying glass, and that means that I'm still in that zoom mode. Uh, to be able to, a lot of people will try to then start clicking and editing, but you have to turn off that zoom selection tool by clicking up here and then you get your, your regular cursor back. So that's how you, you do that. Uh, another idea is, let's put this back to 100% here. Another idea to give yourself some more workspace is to take uh, these tools, maybe it's the database spy output window and the project explorer, and set them up into an auto hide mode. So I can take this little pin tool here and uh, click on it and it will auto hide those. So now if I want these tools, in fact, let's do this with the Project Explorer too, it will auto-hide that, give us more screen real estate. But if I want them, I can just mouse over. I'm not even clicking. I'm just mousing over. I can uh, use these tools, and when I uh, click back on the workspace or move my mouse out of that area, uh, they, they contract. And uh, again, I get some more workspace area. Uh, another thing that can be done uh, temporarily is you can minimize the ribbon and so now you've really got uh, about the maximum amount of screen space that uh, you can have there. Um, uh, what a lot of people have, have uh, done is they've, let's say, accidentally undocked uh, one of these windows. Let me 
unpin this and take this output window. And you get this standard uh, Windows tool to be able to, to dock these uh, windows in various locations or leave them floating. That's also an option as well. But let's say you've uh, uh, forgotten how it used to be set up and want to go back to the way that it was or maybe accidentally got yourself into this mode. You can uh, always, uh, let me put this back here, uh, go into View and then this Restore Default will put everything back to the way that it was. So that's a very handy tool to, to kind of get you back to ground zero and, and, and make it easy to, to find where everything is uh, again. Um, also another tool that's uh, uh, not checked by default is this zoom box. This gives you a, uh, a zoomed in view wherever your cursor is. You can see the little dot here in the middle. Um, that's the uh, point where your cursor is. And uh, if you need to do some very fine editing, you can do that uh, as well. And I believe if you, uh, you can see right now it defaults to 800%. You can double left click and that will zoom in, um, giving you some very, very fine. Uh, or you can double right click and that will zoom back out. Um, so you can get, uh, get that way that you want it. But I'm going to go ahead and close that for now. Uh, so there's some nice uh, user interface uh, uh, concepts there as well. Let's uh, take a look at the next thing. That's auto-hide, resetting the default. Uh, oh, uh, something else that's often overlooked is the horizontal and vertical tab groups. So let's say that you uh, happen to be working on a button, and you have some VB script, let's say, on this, uh, this button, or maybe it's on a screen script. Um, so now I have this screen script that is tied or, or part of this screen, and then I also have the screen. Rather than uh, clicking on these different tabs, one of the things that you can do is you can right click on this tab and say I want a new vertical tab group and now what it'll do is it'll split that and I can have the, the graphical part of the screen open and the script open side by side so now I can uh, work with those simultaneously. So a lot of people uh, either don't know that that's there or they overlook it or, or forget it and uh, it's, it's easy to forget especially if you're like myself I'm not really a VB script uh, programmer, but uh, every time that I do this, it's like, oh yeah, I keep forgetting that that's there. So, a very handy uh, uh, tool to have. Uh, let's see. Uh, double click on a cell to get to the object explorer. This is a, a thing that I, I uh, uh, first of all, if you, if you don't know who I am, uh, I've been with IndieSoft for about five years, six years, uh, uh, and I've taught a lot of the training classes uh, at IndieSoft and. Uh, one of the things that I've seen students uh, do time and time again is get a little bit frustrated about how the interface works when you're trying to, uh, let's say, choose uh, a tag expression here uh, and you want to double click on a cell to call up the object finder. Well, I'm double clicking, double clicking, and it's not coming up. Uh, I can always click on this browse button if there is one available. There's not always one available, uh, but if I click off of that cell and then double click on that cell to bring it up, let's uh, uh, do a, a little bit different uh, interface here. Let's say uh, in the math worksheet. So if I'm on this cell already and I double click, it edits that cell. But let's say that I want to uh, choose the tag from the object finder. If I click off of that cell, and then the very first thing before I select that cell, if I double click on it, then it brings up the object finder. Uh, there's another uh, part, of, part of this that's uh, often misunderstood. If I want to edit this, and rather than double clicking and, and knowing when to do what, uh, if I want to edit this, I can hit the F2 key on my keyboard, and that will put my cursor in there and allow me to uh, uh, start editing as well. So um, that's another uh, portion. Uh, of the, the user interface. Uh, and then what you just saw, so for example, is, is let's say that I mistyped uh, the tag. So let's say there was a tag that I had was temperature, um, and I mistyped it. Uh, boy, that's a horrible mistyping. But then it prompts me, uh, that doesn't exist. Do you want to create this tag? Well, as part of the user interface, we've made it easy to uh, help you fix your mistakes. And maybe you've typed in a really long expression. Maybe this was in the expression field, and you've typed several hundred characters and done a big math uh, logical expression. Uh, you, you say, okay, I don't want to create that as a tag. Say no. Uh, but here, 
um, one of the things that it does, let me go over here and do this expression. Uh, so let's uh, put in uh, uh, second, and we'll do plus, and uh, I don't know why we'll ever do this, but then let's say that we have a, a typo in here, and we added in a, a, a something that didn't exist, let's say that temperature, that fake temperature tag. Okay, that tag doesn't exist. Do you want to create it? Say no. Then what it does is it prompts you, do you want to set this expression as a comment? Now, this is a convenience feature in the user interface. If you say yes, what it does is it puts two slashes in here so that it comments out or remarks that expression out. It then allows you to fix your problem. And let's say uh, I didn't want that tag anyway. Then you can uncomment this out, and that, that will allow you to... Uh, uh, continue on without losing all that uh, text or logic that you've typed. So that's a uh, what I think is a great user interface feature, but often misunderstood because a lot of times we don't read those pop-up things. We just say no, no, cancel, and, and go on. So um, those are another nice uh, feature. Um, and then something uh, since version 7.1 that a lot of people don't realize is in the product is dragging and dropping of, of cells and fields. So for example, let's go back to this. Let me close this script here. Let's go back to this uh, um, math worksheet here and, and say uh, temp, and uh, I'll say 1. Well, what we can do, rather than hitting Control-C and Control-V um, to copy and paste, um, one of the new features that we have, let's get rid of this, <laughs> there's my, uh, is I can click on it, hold down my control, just like I can do with objects, hold down the control key and see the little plus there? That allows me to then drag that uh, down. Uh, so once I uh, select that field, hold down my control, then I can drag. Uh, so then if I have multiple of these, I can just change just the last little bit of text if I need to, or, or an array number, things of that nature. So uh, those are some other nice features. And that also works in some of these other cells as well. So let's say, uh, I had, not that I would ever do this, and I don't know if this is even going to work in the description field. Uh, um, that in, in some of these fields, you can hold down control and drag. And it uh, looks like it doesn't specifically work in that one, but it does work in some of the other fields as well. So let's try it from here. Uh, here, put up in there. So it does work uh, in other fields. So it doesn't only work in the worksheets. Now let's uh, uh, take a look at this uh, filter. Uh, this is something that we've added fairly recently, I think in Service Pack 2 or, or somewhere around there, this uh, filtering. So let's say that I've got uh, uh, Tag A, that doesn't exist. Uh, I'm going to the runtime here. Sorry about that. Uh, temp 1, temp 2, and pressure. And uh, maybe I've got several hundred or, or several thousand tags in here. Uh, one of the things I can do is filter this and say, I want to see only the tags that begin with the letter P. So I can filter that out. I can also uh, say, OK, I want only the tags that begin with the letter T. Uh, and I can also use wildcards in here. So I can use a question mark for any uh, for a single character or the uh, asterisk uh, for all characters uh, as well. So there's uh, some different ways that I can use that as well. Uh, so moving along, so that's dragging and dropping. Um, okay, so now we're going to switch gears a little bit and go into the uh, user interface that you might create for a project. Uh, so just some ideas or some thoughts uh, to think about this. Uh, it's always a, a great idea, a good idea, to keep an interface that's uh, very easy to see and very easy to understand. And one of the things that I've been seeing uh, that the customers have been doing is using a lot less color. Um, some recent things that I've seen uh, be popular is to kind of grayscale, uh, not use a lot of color unless there's uh, an issue or a problem or attention that needs to be drawn to an object. Um, so what I'm seeing is a lot of uh, almost black and white or grayscale color screens, a lot less color, and then um, only highlighting an object in red if there's a problem there or blinking it if there's a problem there. Um, one of the things that if you're not aware of this, um, and, and I've seen different studies, somewhere between 8 and 10% of men are colorblind, and a lot less uh, women are colorblind, um, usually somewhere less than 1%, uh, usually like 0.1%. Uh, 
so that's uh, something that you need to be aware of. So, so just changing colors, and I think about 80% of those that are colorblind uh, are actually red-green colorblind, so the, they can't distinguish between red and green. So about 10% of your user base might not be able to distinguish between on and off just based on green and red changing colors. So one of the things that, that uh, I've shown in several of the different webinars and training videos that I like to do is changing the words on or off or open or closed based on an if statement. And, and what I'm going to do is show you how to do that uh, um, if you don't know. So one of the things that I'm going to do here is uh, go back to my screen. And what I'm going to do is we've got several different ways to display text. I can use a text object. I can use a list box. I can use a rectangle with a caption, uh, even on a button. Let's take a, a, a button, let's say, and I want this thing to toggle my mode. Uh, so let's say this is an auto uh, mode here. And I want to know the status of that. So rather than putting a, a separate status lamp somewhere uh, to consolidate my user interface, uh, what I'm going to do, let's, let's first get this thing to work here. Let's uh, turn this into a command animation. I will use the toggle tag, and I'll create a tag called auto mode. That doesn't exist. I'm going to go down here and make it a Boolean. Now, uh, I know you can't see this, but what I've done is I've tabbed down to the to the type here, and rather than uh, moving my hand off the keyboard and, and grabbing the mouse, what I can then do is just hit the letter B for Boolean, and then since uh, the OK button has focus, then I can just hit my Enter key. So that makes it very quick to choose what type, what uh, uh, tag I want to be, and I haven't moved my fingers off the key at all. Uh, so that, uh, uh, that's another nice user interface feature. So let me go back to the button here. And so that says auto mode. And let me show you how you might do this. Uh, let's put a lamp on here, or a circle, and we'll tie it to a color. I'm going to put auto mode in here. And let's say I don't want to type that. What I can do is uh, click on this, go back to my project symbols, pick auto mode, say OK, and it'll change red or green. So uh, just to prove that this thing is working, let's go ahead and run this. And now it's red, and I click on it, it changes to green. and. Uh, there's a fair amount of you in the audience today, so uh, there's a chance that maybe some of you can't differentiate between those red and green colors that are showing up there. So uh, what I might do is I might add here on the button, um, let me go back to the button here, and put some text. Now if you don't know this, you can put uh, tag names or built-in expressions, built-in functions inside of curly brackets and they will evaluate during runtime. So what I want to do is, is I might, let's start out slow here and put in auto mode in the tag, uh, the tag inside of curly brackets. And now when I run this, um, it will show me a 1 or a 0. Well, that's not very humanly readable. Uh, most operators aren't going to understand what the difference between a 0 and a 1 is. So let's uh, add a little bit of logic in here. Let's use the if statement. So I'm going to do if. And the way that the if statement works is there's a parenthesis there. So I put in if parenthesis. And the way that this works is if this is true, then I do this statement. Uh, in this case, what I'm going to do is make that text show the word on. And else, if this is false, then I'm going to show the word off. So it's if this is true, then do this, or if this is false, then do this. So this will assign the word on or off inside of those curly brackets. And I need to close this up with a closing parenthesis there at the end. And uh, now the way that this should work is if I can see auto mode is off. I click on it, and then it says auto mode is on. And another way that you could do this is, is take that same expression uh, that I just put in there, copy that, and let's say you wanted to show this up on uh, the lamp. Let's say, well, uh, unfortunately on a circle we don't have the ability to, or an ellipse, we don't have a caption field. What I can do is put a rectangle over the top of this and change, uh, get rid of the border, get rid of the fill, and then in the caption field put in that same expression. And uh, what I might want to do is change its colors or figure that out. But now, uh, what I can do is I can have both uh, the color change and the word change. So now that you're you're taking into account color blindness as well. 
Uh, let's see. What's the next topic that I wanted to... Uh, for touchscreen interfaces, um, keep menus on the right or the bottom. Uh, I did a, a, a quick search of the Internet, and I realized that uh, quite uh, most people, um, and, and it varies um, on, on where you come from, are right-handed. Uh, so, for example, if you have a touchscreen and you have all of your alarms let's say in the bottom right hand corner of your screen, but you're constantly touching uh, on the top part of the screen or the left part of the screen, your arm may be covering up critical alarms. So it, uh, just a thought might be to put uh, navigation uh, along the left hand side or commonly used functions, uh, I'm sorry, I said left hand side, along the right hand side or the bottom of the interface and um, that way you're not covering up uh, critical enunciations or alarms. Um, and while I'm thinking about it, let's, uh, let's take, uh, for example, how to uh, make a menu across the bottom uh, very quickly and, and talk a little bit about user interface uh, stuff as well. Let's say that I'm going to put some buttons uh, down here across the bottom, and I know my screen, let's say, is uh, 1024 by 768, uh, and I need 10 buttons. So how many of these do I have to make? What I can do is I've, I've been hitting the control key there. What I can do is I can hold down the uh, shift key, select multiple of those, then hold down control and uh, copy these. And let's say that I don't get these exactly uh, lined up properly. So that's nine. Let's make a tenth one over here. Uh, some user interface things that I can do is I might window around those and select those all. Go here into Format, Align, uh, align those all to the top, and they will reference that last one that was selected. Notice they all shift up to meet this one. Now let's say that I want this uh, menu to span all the way, and now that I've done that, I've moved this object, so I'll have to, to, to do that again. Let's say I want them all to reference uh, this object here. Now that I've got that in the bottom corner, what I can do is, again, hold down my Shift key, and select. Let's say you, you want to deselect one of these. You can hold down the Shift key and double click on an object and that will remove it from that selection list. Um, <clears throat> but again, I want this uh, object here to be the last one because I want to align everything with that. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'm going to go to Format, Align, Align to the top. Those should all move down. And now what I want to do is I want to spread these out evenly across here. Uh, and I'm going to start with this uh, rightmost object and the leftmost object, and then I'm going to use this uh, evenly distribute horizontally, and it will space those objects uh, from beginning to end in between those beginning and ending objects. <coughs> Excuse me, uh, evenly, so you can create some nice menuing and, and even menuing that way. Um, so another question that we had. Uh, excuse me for a second. I have to cough really quickly. Let me grab a drink of water here. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, another question that we had come in um, when we announced this uh, webinar was was how to move some objects, whether it be a box, a carton, a drum, or part of a machine, around in 3D. So what I'm going to do is uh, I actually created this object uh, in my PowerPoint presentation. I created this little 3D box, and what I did is I drew a square, and I right-clicked on it, and I told it it had some 3D depth and I changed its color. And now what I can do is I can actually copy this object and go back into IndieSoft Web Studio and paste it in here. Now I don't know if you can see, but there's actually a white rectangle around that. For those of you who don't know, uh, we can actually remove that. We can change a, a single color to be transparent. And I'm going to uh, choose that via this tracker. And what that does is it gives me this little extra handle here. And now wherever I move that handle, that color becomes transparent. So if I select that white rectangle that borders that, uh, then that becomes transparent. So now what I'm going to do is take this box or this carton, and this could be representing any part of your machine, and uh, I'm going to move this around a little bit. So the first thing that I'm going to do is um, uh, put a slider on the screen and go to here, my system symbols, sliders, and uh, grab slider 1. And that's going to give me a value by default of 0 to 100. Let's change this as size. And I'll create that tag as an integer. And 
then what I'll do is I will put a resize animation or size resize animation on this object and I will change its height and its width based on that that tag. Now what I might want to do is is while that slider is going to go from 0 to 100, I might want to not have it go invisible. I might want to have it be from 20%. Um, so uh, uh, we'll do that. We'll also have it reference the bottom and the center so it shrinks uh, kind of uh, from the bottom area and then from the middle out. Now uh, what I'll also do is I, I want to have this say go off into the distance like maybe it's going down a conveyor belt away from me. Uh, so at the same time, I can add a position animation to this. And um, what I'm going to do is have that vertically go up, make it look like it's going away from me. And I'll just use that same tag. It doesn't have to be that same tag. It could be a different uh, uh, independent tag. But that's also going to go from uh, 0 to 100. And uh, what I'm going to do is have that go when it's at the low end of the scale, maybe the farthest away uh, from me. I want that to be 300 pixels up. So that's negative 300 pixels. So because the x direction increases from left to right, the y direction increases from top to bottom. I want this to go off into the distance and get smaller and smaller. So I'm going to start uh, there as well. So this is going to be uh, also referenced from the bottom. And now when I move that slider, let me move this down here a little bit. Now when I move that slider, what it's going to do, should do, is look like uh, it's closest to me, and then it looks like it moves away. So uh, just creating a, a simple uh, thing can, can give yourself some depth. Uh, I've worked with some companies that have had uh, 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 railing systems that have gripped objects and then moved them. We've uh, made it look like it was coming up into the screen, moving across the screen, and then, and then dropping off as well. Uh, another idea that, that can be done, especially on smaller screens, is to create a menuing system. And if you have questions on how to do this, I'm not going to get into the, to the details of this. But one of the things that you can do is um, create, let's say, an object here and put uh, menu buttons on this object. And we'll do this. And then group this whole thing apply a, a position animation to this, this whole thing, and horizontally move this off of the right edge of the screen. So maybe only this area here is, is uh, visible. Maybe put a button on there that would allow you to uh, change a tag that would then slide this thing out. You could use the menu and then slide it back in, kind of like an auto hide on your taskbar. Uh, in Windows, it would work that uh, that same way. So that uh, can get you some really good screen real estate, especially when you have smaller screens. Creates some nice uh, interfaces there. Um, back to my PowerPoint here. Uh, choosing a background, color, and/or shadow. Okay, so uh, let me go ahead and uh, create another screen uh, here. So I'll just save this screen as main and uh, then create a brand new screen. Now let's say that you're creating a, a really nice dashboard or some type of user interface where maybe you've got some uh, rounded rectangles. I'm going to change the radius on this, this rounding here a little bit. And uh, maybe uh, it, it's real common to have you know, maybe a nice gray color in there and put my text or whatever I want in here. And, uh, but you want that to pop off the screen a little bit. Let me actually change this back to white here. Uh, maybe I want that to just uh, stand up off the screen a little bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a copy of this and offset it a little bit. Go back to the back one and uh, change this to, let's say, kind of a light gray, get rid of the border, and kind of layer that over the top there. Now when I run this, it's got that uh, little stand, stand off there a little bit. And uh, let's say that uh, you change the background color of your screen. And I change this to be black. And now when I run this, let's change this border color to be black. And now when I run this, that can make that look a little bit uh, like it's standing off a little bit. But I don't care for that solid color. What I might do 
is to give it to, because we don't really have a drop shadow uh, feature within IndieSoft Web Studio. What I might do is change that uh, that uh, back rectangle, rounded rectangle, to have a visibility animation on it. And in, within IndieSoft Web Studio, um, just a, a couple, boy, I think uh, Service Pack 2 came out with this. I don't remember. It's a fairly recent uh, update. If you uh, uh, have an existing project, you'll have to go manually into the project and then viewer and enable enhanced graphics. Uh, but if you start a new project, that will already be uh, checked for you. If you uh, uh, come in here into the visibility position animation, and in the past this was called a show on condition. Well, in, again, I think it was Service Pack 2, we allowed this to be a, um, not only a Boolean, so it would either be show or, or shown or hidden, but now it could be a real type number. So let's say I put a, a 0.3 on here. So now that's going to be uh, transparent uh, with a 30% a uh, transparency on it. And now when we run this, uh, it's got that little bit of color uh, kind of fading out. And another option to do here is um, instead of just having it a solid fill color, I can say, okay, I want this to go from uh, black to white and fill in a diagonal this way. And uh, now it looks a little bit more like a, a drop shadow might look. And you can experiment with the different uh, uh, transparency levels uh, to do that. So let, let's talk about e experimenting a little bit and uh, how you might choose. Let's say I, I want to choose a background color that's, that's pleasing and lets me see uh, fonts uh, quite a far distance away. Let's say that I've, I've put some text on the screen. Let me put this on a rectangle. and. Um, I want to see what's readable here. This is text, and maybe I put this on a, a white font or a, a yellow font, and I want to see what becomes uh, more readable for my users, especially from a, a farther distance away. Let me increase the font size here a little bit so you can see this. And uh, I don't, in this case, want a border. I don't want to fill. And okay, so I want to do some testing. And maybe I want to do this testing also with uh, not only colors, but with the, the transparency or the visibility. So one of the things that I've done is uh, just as a test, uh, before I set the background color, because it's a little difficult, not difficult, but uh, it takes a few mouse clicks to come in here, set the background colors, and run it, then test it. Uh, one of the things that I've done is just drawn a rectangle uh, around the objects that I want to test with. Let's say I'll push this uh, rectangle to the back. Oh, look at this. I have this tool up here that sends that to the back. That's handy. Um, and then what I'll do is I will apply a color animation to this. Well, when we did the, the lamp a few minutes ago for that auto uh, mode button, we just put the tag in here. And that was because this was set by limit, and these were the change limits. I can alter this and choose by color. And I can put a color code in here that's a decimal representation of an RGB, or a red, green, and blue number. Uh, I can put some, some numbers in here. And in the help system, it shows you uh, how to calculate or, or where the, the red and the green and the blue come into play. Or we can use a built-in function called RGB color. And inside of the, the function, it takes three parameters, the red from 0 to 255, the green and the blue from 0 to 255. So I'm going to make three tags, red, comma, green, if I can spell right, and blue. And it's going to prompt me for those tags. I'm going to make those each integers. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some sliders on the screen. I'm going to put three sliders on the screen to allow me to adjust those colors. Well, by default, this slider defaults to 0 to 100. I can change that value. And this is, uh, I'm also trying to illustrate a, a user interface thing here too. I could have put three sliders on and then gone back and configured each of these max instead of 100 to 255 uh, one at a time. But instead of doing them like that, what I want to do is configure uh, this one first. Then I'll make copies. And notice that I don't have to close my object properties. I can leave that floating. That's another nice user interface feature of IndieSoft Web Studio. I can copy these. Now I can go back and add in my tags. 
Uh, and I don't have to type. I can actually, as I mentioned, I can click off of this, double click, and choose red. Click on OK. Go to the next one, uh, green. And I don't have to uh, even click on the OK. I can double click here, double click on blue, and that accepts that for me. So some really fine tools for uh, making your development uh, speedier and, and a little bit easier. So now I have red and green and blue going from 0 to 255. I have this rectangle changing based on this function for red, green, and blue. And now when I run this project or, or run this screen, what I can do is I can change these sliders and I can adjust my colors. Uh, maybe I want something that's uh, purple, let's say. And I can see the different colors. I can see how this is going to interact with my uh, different transparencies in my text and, and uh, you know for example yellow text is is uh, much more readable on, on let's say a black than it would be on white uh, and if I uh, change these to all approximately the same level that will become some level of gray so for example uh, down here will be a little bit darker as, as well Got a little bit too much green component in there but uh, then by using these numbers you'll be able to then calculate out the number that you want uh, your background color and then uh, all at once uh, go in here and apply this background color and uh, what you can do is add a custom color let's say and then put in your red your green and your blue value in here and that will give you that exact uh, color uh, in there so that's a, a very handy uh, way to do that in addition that uh, let's say that transparency let's uh, take that shadow out of there and uh, let me get rid of this, uh, move this over here. And let's say that, that I'm not quite sure what uh, transparency level I want this to be to be visible uh, uh, just slightly. Let's say I want to make this uh, look like it's uh, slightly transparent so that interface. Let's say I, I try a, a 0.3 or a whatever and it's not exactly right. What I can do is I can temporarily uh, uh, put in a tag, I'll call it viz, and now this is important to choose this as a real, not an integer. And then what I'll do is I'll take uh, one of my slider, uh, let's see, uh, probably a little bit easier is to just put in uh, some text here. And uh, I'll give myself pound dot, pound, 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 pound. And then I will tie this to the tag called viz. And now what I can do is I can adjust this during runtime and see uh, okay, so visibility zero, that thing is gone. And guess what I didn't do? I didn't put uh, input enabled on here. So let's check that. And so now when I uh, change my value here, let's say I want this to be 0.3. Now I can see that a little bit, but maybe that's not exactly right. Maybe I want it to be 0.5, uh, 0.7, go up there. Okay, 0.65. That's about the right transparency that I like, and, and now I can uh, uh, use that or put this hard code this number in here. Or uh, you can leave that as a, a, a modifiable or configurable number uh, during runtime and let the, the users configure that uh, if they'd like. So that's a, a way to do that as well. All right, so moving along, let's see the next uh, uh, thing that I wanted to cover here. Let's go back up here is uh, so that's visibility, uh, templates and shadows. Uh, uh, it's always a good idea to, uh, to keep a common look and feel in your interface. And one way to do that is symbols. Uh, if you don't know this, you can uh, use, um, uh, you can create your own symbols. And we have a whole webinar that we did just a few weeks ago on creating your own symbols. We also have uh, in our online store, and let me open up our website here. Uh, real quick, we've been doing a symbol of the week uh, function, uh, function, sorry, symbol of the week feature uh, and posting those in our blog as well as uh, in our online store here. So if you go to our uh, store under free add-ons, you can see some of the various uh, extra symbols. We've added some meters, we've added uh, some gauges, some different types of gauges. My personal favorite are these uh, vertical LED meters. Uh, recently we've done some uh, data displays, some colored column gauges that are almost like thermometers, wind direction, and uh, status limits, I.O. faceplate, so it looks like uh, it's the I.O. module within the PLC rack, and uh, 
So there's a lot of, a lot of new symbols that we've added in here. We'd love your comments or suggestions on what you'd like to see added uh, when it comes to symbols. But in addition, addition to the uh, uh, versatility that the symbol library brings for um, uh, being able to ease of use grab from that store, it gives you uh, the ability to create a common uh, from screen to screen user interface. Um, one of the things that we were asked as, as questions uh, um, that we had as, as input before this webinar was how to create some uh, better looking 3D things. Well, we, we have some new objects that are coming out uh, fairly soon, uh, some meters, some uh, not meters, some motors, some pumps, some uh, valves, uh, some piping, things of that nature. But I, uh, I wanted to show you how you might uh, be able to create just some very easy, let me go ahead and create another screen here a very easy way to create using native objects within Indusoft Web Studio, some nice 3D bevels. What I'm going to do is I'm going to format this circle uh, as 300 by 300. And I'm going to then remove the, uh, the border line, and I'm going to change the fill color to a gradient fill. Now this only works on Windows PCs. This will not work on embedded or uh, Windows CE, so be aware of that. Uh, then what I'm going to do is change uh, my gradient here, change it to diagonal, and uh, I'm going to create some layering effects. And the first one that I'm going to have is the, the lighter color up in the left-hand left corner to a darker color down in the lower right. I'm then going to copy this object, and then I'm going to reduce its size by about 10 pixels. I'm going to go down to 290, and I'm going to reverse the, uh, instead of being light to dark, I'm going to have it go from dark to light. And I'm going to copy this object again. And uh, then what I'm going to do is change the size of this again by about 10 pixels down to 280. And you can uh, play with the uh, adjustments on here. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the fill of this. Uh, instead of being black like this, I'm going to make it uh, white to kind of a light gray from the center. And I might just have a little touch of shadowing there in the middle. And uh, now when I... Uh, select all three of these objects, and do a format, align center, and align middle. Uh, it, you can see that it creates a nice 3D beveled look. And you can use this for buttons, make a little bit thicker. And then I could put a needle on here and rotate that uh, around the middle point uh, as well. So that's a, uh, another nice uh, feature there. Uh, talk about rotating objects and graphics. Uh, I'm running a, a little bit out of time here. Uh, I don't want to go too much over. Uh, people have asked us not to go too much over if we, because uh, they've only allocated that much time. Uh, there is uh, part of our training uh, classes how to rotate uh, objects and graphics, and and uh, one of the things that that uh, we do in that class is we specifically talk about how to choose the point on on which it rotates. Again, I'm not going to go into this this detail here, but um, uh, how to choose the, the reference point. In this case, it's the top left. Well, this is only a one or two pixel, so it's going to rotate right now around this point. I want it to rotate around this point. Uh, so in this case, I would choose left bottom, and it would rotate around there. But if that uh, was, let's say, a, a needle on a uh, meter that had uh, some width to it, let's say that I used a closed polygon and I made a uh, triangular shape to form a, a needle, um, how would I choose this center point? Because when you choose the, the rotation uh, animation, you don't have the choice of, let's see, center is the center point of here. You don't have a bottom center. So that's when you use this offset. And, and we get into that in some of the training videos, so feel free to take a look at those. Uh, what I do want to, to cover is a request that we had of, of how to show factual inter information, whether it be PDF or graphics. Um, and a few different uh, things come to mind. One of the things that I'm going to do is I'm going to go out to, um, uh, let's see, I already have this open. I have a couple of uh, graphics that I created before this webinar, and I'm going to um, copy those. What I've done is I have test.jpg and test.png, and you can see they're just multicolors here. What I'm going to do is um, copy these into, uh, let's see, where my... There we go. Let's go into Documents. Let's go into my project. And this is uh, User Interface Webinar. And I'm just going to paste these right into my root folder of my project.
project here. So they're right here. Now, you might want to choose to put those in your web subfolder if you're doing a web-related project. Just for ease of use, I'm going to put them here. Uh, now, what I wanted to point out is to make this project portable, uh, what we can do is we could um, uh, put a linked picture reference. Let me go back up to here, and I'll add my JPEG in here. If I uh, do this, and this references my PC, if I move this project to a different PC or download it, it might not find those. One of the things that you might want to do is use the feature in here, and I'm not going to, because I'm running out of time, I'm going to uh, not do this in, in great detail, but what you might want to do is put in uh, the built-in function. Let me show you how this works down here in the database spy. Get uh, app path and then uh, open and close parenthesis. And what that does is that returns the path of where the project currently is. So that if you move this to a different folder or a different PC, it will automatically, and you can have that within curly brackets in here, get um, app path. And I often get the syntax of this a little bit wrong, but you'll get the point. There we go. Uh, whether or not you need a plus sign in there, in this case it looks like it's finding it, but um, whether or not you need a plus sign to concatenate that or not, uh, I usually go through a little bit of troubleshooting to do that. But you can see then this becomes much more portable uh, for that. Uh, another question that we had is, is working with uh, some graphics. One of the things I wanted to point out is, uh, in this case, this linked picture, as I point out that transparent color is chosen by this little tracker here. So you can see as I move this into black, all the black becomes transparent or green or so forth. So in this way, case, uh, I'm using a JPEG, and that's one color is transparent. Um, one of the things that we can do, and uh, I don't know if I have this set up, but we'll, we'll certainly give it a try, is um, I think with this test, yeah, I did this. Uh, so this PNG has a transparent center point here. And with PNGs, you can get the transparent color uh, from the, the PNG file itself. In addition to that, you can have another one, which will be this, this tracker, or you can choose by color code. So you can have multiple or two colors be transparent uh, if you need to. So that, that works with PNG. And that's, that's something that uh, came about fairly recently as well. Um, the last little thing is, is here how to show factual information, whether it be PDF or graphics. Um, and, and with this, the way that I brought this linked symbol in here, you can change this uh, by using a string tag in here, and you can change the file that it points to. So you can change the graphic <clears throat> that it points to. Uh, and one of the other things that I wanted to do is, let's say that you wanted to show uh, a PDF. There's a few different ways to launch a PDF, and, and one way that I'm going to do this, I'm going to combine a couple questions that were asked, is uh, how to interact uh, by using VBScript. I am going to put a, uh, an ActiveX web browser on the screen, so I'm going to come down here and grab uh, what's basically Internet Explorer and grab uh, Microsoft Web Browser. Again, that's Internet Explorer. And that is uh, going to put us a little window here on the screen. Now, I can go ahead and put in, uh, in this object, in under methods, it allows me to put in an address, a, a URL. I could put in the PDF file uh, path right in here. Or I can optionally navigate to this using um, uh, a tag. Uh, or I can communicate with this using uh, uh, com and decom behind the scenes. So let's say that I wanted to call up a PDF file. One of the things I can do here is uh, put a button, let's say, because you don't want to put an address bar where your users can type in Facebook or um, um, Google or just anything random. Let's say that we wanted to call up the manual. And what I might do is here in VBScript, uh, I can communicate with this object. So this object right now has a name of Microsoft Web Browser 1. I don't want to type all that, so I'm going to change this and, and uh, shorten this or abbreviate this to Microsoft Web Browser MWB 1. Now to communicate with this, um, here on the button in VB Script, I can just give this the name of that object, MWB 1. And as soon as I hit period or dot on my keyboard, it's going to expose those properties, methods, and events that I have access to. There's that um, method, navigate to, 
And if I select that and then put in uh, parentheses, then it'll give me the IntelliSense and show me uh, I can give it a URL. Well, the URL that I want to go to is my very similar to how I use this this uh, application path. I know that in my driver folder of where Indusoft Web Studio was installed, uh, I can get at that uh, PDF for let's say driver manuals. So here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a dollar sign. I'm going to say get. Notice the IntelliSense is, is prompting me there. Uh, product. If I spell this right, product path. And you can see that it's uh, already highlighted there. I have to open and close parentheses here. And then I'm going to concatenate. Uh, and I know just from experience that this gives me the ending backslash on there. So I'm going to tell it then to add on DRV for the subfolder, backslash MOTCP.PDF. Close the, the quote, and then close the parentheses up for this. Right click and check my script. That works. <coughs> Excuse me, syntax that works anyway. It doesn't mean it's going to work. And then when I run this, I should be able to click on that button. It's going to go to my product path. It's going to get that PDF. It's going to uh, use the um, uh, built in extension within the Microsoft web browser for my PDF and display that document and allow me to, to scroll through this. So, um, User interface wise, uh, those of you may or may not know that uh, multi touch is now available within Indusoft Web Studio. And I know that uh, when you have a PDF like this, you can uh, scroll and swipe uh, within that interface and it'll, it'll scroll your, your document. So uh, hopefully you've learned a few things <clears throat> within uh, um, uh, the user interface. Uh, let's see, there's a question here. Do we have any plans to support .NET for controls in IWS? Um, I, it's been a little while since I've sat in on the development meetings. I don't believe we have any uh, plans to support .NET 4 uh, currently. Um, feel free to, to send that question into support um, because I, I just don't know off the top of my head. Uh, let's see. Uh, a lot of uh, comments coming in. Uh, people have uh, gained a lot from the webinar. Appreciate the comments. Feel free, again, to uh, let us know what kind of symbols you'd like to see and uh, other webinars. And uh, let's see, at this point, I don't see any other questions coming in. I uh, really appreciate all, uh, everybody's attendance. Uh, you, you should receive an email survey. Uh, and uh, again, you can get a free t-shirt if you give us your information. And uh, just to quickly end this, um, how to uh, contact us. If you have any uh, questions, feel free to, to throw those in here. Uh, more comments coming in. Thank you very much. And uh, with that, I apologize. I went just slightly over, but uh, hopefully you've learned some things. And uh, feel free to join us again for another webinar. And these are being recorded and will be posted online in just a couple of days. So thank you, everybody, and uh, have a great day.